Corporal John Foster McGill Jr., United States Army, World War II. I had the great honor and privilege of meeting and interviewing John in Abington, Maryland, September 7, 2008. John served with the prestigious 17th Airborne Division, the Golden Talons, which was an Airborne Infantry Division of the United States Army during World War II, commanded by Major General William M. Miley. John received a Purple Heart for being wounded in action during World War II. He fought at the Battle of the Bulge. He's featured in my film, The Battle of the Bulge. And he also participated in Operation Varsity. And John was a lifelong member of the Order of the Purple Heart. And just an amazing, amazing man. I miss him dearly. Him and his wife, Anna, they became dear friends of mine. I met up with him afterwards, went to a couple of his reunions back east, was a great supporter of my work. And of all the World War II stories I've done over the years, folks, this is one of the best, if not the best. I love you, John. I know he's in heaven looking down on us today, and his wife Anna's there too now. But such fond memories of him. And I want to thank John Horton. John, thank you for making it possible for others to hear and to learn and to listen to John McGill today. God bless you, John Horton. Thank you for your patriotism and your commitment to our veterans and for making this possible. Folks, my heart's warm today. My heart's full today on New Year's Day today, 2023. If you'd like to become a, a sponsor of one of my stories, I know a lot of you have inquired of it. I would really highly encourage that. Like I said, I don't monetize my video style commercials. So this is supported by you, the viewers and listeners. And there's a lot of you out there. And I know we're, we're doing good. We're doing good. And we're reaching a lot of people and inspiring them, motivating them. We live in a country where we need to be reminded of these freedoms that we have. History is best learned from those who are there. And I've got the stories, folks. I need your help in, in bringing them forth. So if you'd like to sponsor a story, there's information in the video description below this video. If you'd like to donate to my work, there's a link in the comment section. Or you can go to LarryCapetto.com and sponsor a vet. So God bless you. Thank you. I, like I said, my heart's full of days. I shared John's story with you. He was just one of my most all-time favorite veterans. And I, like I said, I miss him dearly. And he became a teacher, a superintendent of the schools back in Pennsylvania after, after the war. And he passed away in 2013. So we salute you, Brother McGill. God bless you, and I'll talk to you soon. Eighty-five. Okay. Eighty-five. What year did you go into the military? In uh, December of forty-two. Drafted or enlisted? N enlisted. So tell me, tell me this. What do you remember about when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Tell me where you were and how you heard the news. I was home at Sugarloaf on the farm when oh, the okay. when when the no news came. And Monday morning, I was reporting to Bloomsburg University, where I was had begun and enrolled as a freshman. And it was at that time then that those of us that sat in Dr. Custer's class were interviewed by him because he was a World War I vet, and he said, "You are my boys. 
He said, I will pray for you as you go because he said, I know what it was like to be under fire. So there I was in Bloomsburg, and I was able to finish that semester, and that was, uh, and I enlisted and was called up then by December of 42. And Army, you were in the Army? Yes, where did you have Army your, Airborne. Where did you have your basic training? I had, first of all, artillery spotter, or artillery forward observer training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma for 13 weeks, and then we went as a contingent, those that had volunteered. You had to volunteer, you know, for the airborne. And while you were allowed $50 extra a month, it was something that was highly difficult and, and, and greatly uh, vigorous. So uh, we reported to Fort Benning and had our jump training there. At what point, John, and you were, what, how old at this time? Nineteen. Wow. So, and you felt that same sense of duty to serve your country like a lot of young men felt back then? Yes, it was so strange. At Bloomsburg University, at the end of the semester, the current semester, following December 7th, it was unbelievable. The winds of war just swept over that campus and largely by voluntary means, it, it just left it with almost all girls. It was, it was unbelievable and we lost 26 boys and one girl in World War II that had volunteered. So at what point do you go over to Europe? I mean, was it right after your training or were you in the States for a while? Well, jump training consisted of four weeks, four stages to it. And uh, I won't go into those, but we learned everything about packing our own chute. And then after that, I took a two-course, two-week course in what we call rigors. Those are the individuals that also prepare equipment bundles that will be dropped from the undercarriage of the C-47. And then they name me instructor for that type of thing. I, I taught parachute packing to the B-stage kids. And then at the same time, I also was responsible for the rigor work in terms of preparing equipment bundles. Now, were you with the 82nd Air? I forget which. No. The 82nd and the 101st, of course, had preceded the 17th in, in going to Europe. But the, uh, of the four airborne divisions from America, the 11th went overseas to the South Pacific, and the other three, 82nd, 101st, and 17th, were in the ETO. Now, which one were you with again? I was with the 17th. Okay. So that was the official group you were with, the 17th Airborne or Division? What do you call it? Yes, Airborne Division. Approximately 10,000 men, okay. each Airborne Division. What month and year did you go over to Europe? I went over to Europe and landed shortly after D-Day. It was July, early July when we landed there and we began to have vigorous training. Of course, D-Day was over and the ranks of 82nd and 101st were very, very depleted. So they had to get hundreds of kids in to replace those that had been killed or captured or, or uh, wounded. As a result, we did simultaneous training in Europe and including extra jump training with combat uh, conditions simul simulated. And then, of course, we're prepared for what would eventually be Market Garden. Well, what did you know about D-Day? You weren't there when that happened, but what type of information did you have about it? We got a lot of information because we were, there's a, the Airborne Fraternity was very, very tight. And we, of course, would see the 82nd and 101st in, you know, in the town, Swindon, and, of course, and passed to London if we were ever fortunate enough to get it. And as a result, 
you know, we would pry from those fellas the idea, you know, of how it was on their night jump. And as a result, we gained much information from them. The, the, the men that went in on D-Day? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, I mean, a, a monumental event in our history, that, that whole operation. And then you came in in July. And then you, you talked about Operation Market Garden. Is that what you just referred to? Yes. Mark, Market Garden was, how would you say, designed by Monty, Montgomery. Now, because I'll refer to him a number of times in, in contrast to Patton and in contrast to Ike. Montgomery uh, was a great general in North Africa. Somehow or another, he thought he should have been named Supreme Allied Commander instead of Ike. As a result, it was almost like George Washington and the, the subversive elements, you know, that led to the downfall of our best general, Benedict Arnold. He was constantly doing things that were contrary to the cohesiveness of the Allied force which we knew was going to have to desperately, uh, you know, seek out the enemy and, and with all the British and all the American resources we could get. It was then that he devised this very hasty plan in August of uh, what we called it Market Garden, had two words. It consisted of three airborne divisions being dropped at three strategic bridges and the third bridge was on the upper Rhine and if we were successful it would mean that we could turn and drive right into the industrial heartland of Germany and end the war by Christmas. The 101st was scheduled to jump first at the bridge. These were daylight jumps now for a change and much more successful, although heavier in casualties in the air. 82nd was at Nijmegen at the strategic bridge there and the British Tommies, the first Allied Airborne Army uh, division uh, was the, at, going to land at the upper Rhine River and seized the bridge up there at Arnhem. Well, it was so hastily developed, and see, as, a, as fast as the paratroopers could seize their objectives, the armor from Monty's uh, battalion of tanks were supposed to seize and move up a narrow corridor, one road. Well, it was fine. They got to Eindhoven, and the 101st was there. Everything went well. They moved slowly t toward Nijmegen, and another strategic bridge, which cost the 82nd horrible casualties. But they again seized the bridge, both ends, and held it and then the tanks, the British tanks crossed, and as a result, the third bridge, which was up at Arnhem, was the most strategic of all. And would you believe it? The British ordered their men to jump 10 miles away from the bridge to avoid the flak, which is contrary to everything. You've got to land on top of your objective because you don't have jeeps and trucks and tanks. You go in there and with your bare hands and your whatever you can carry and whatever you can put on your equipment bundles. They never did get into the bridge and oh, they slaughtered at least 6,000 of the finest British paratroopers. It's unbelievable that because when Anna and I were over in Holland, we met a man who was 19 at the same time that I was, and he was 
one of those individuals in a Dutch inter- underground, and he swears that they had sent a wire to the British government that there were two panzer divisions equipped with, you know, 60-ton tanks being refitted in the forest there, was, which would not be picked up by an aerial photograph. And Monty, either is because of his eagerness to seize the initiative and, and be, I hate to say it, a hero, ignored it. And it, we went up to Arnhem and 6,000 British Tommies and about 2,000 uh, of the Polish brigade that they put in as, at the last minute. We were in reserve. But Monty's failures to do this would have meant that we would just go in for nothing and, you know. And so as a result, Market Garden failed and the war then was destined to go into December of 1944 and the most tragic and costly battle of in American history, the Battle of the Bulge. Let's, let's go into that now. Your, your, your role at the Battle of the Bulge, walk me into that and just uh, anything you want to share about it and tell me why it was called the Battle of the Bulge. Okay, first of all, the Germans invaded and broke through our lines, which were continuous from the North Sea down to Switzerland, consisting of all of the varied armies, Allied armies. Now, as a result of that, when the Germans broke through at the very same point that they broke through in, in conquering the French in, in the early part of the war, the Germans just had such might, 600,000 men and the, the huge Tiger tanks, which were indescribable. We had nothing to cope with them. Our 36-ton uh, tanks, were uh, you had to outmaneuver them and get behind them in order to knock them out. Well, as a result of that, this massive breakthrough was threatening to cut off the entire uh, Allied army by driving right to Antwerp. And that was their aim. And then force an armistice because, you know, we had early said about unconditional surrender. The three airborne divisions were fortunately at full strength and in England at the time. And in World War II, like the cavalry in 1876 for Custer, were the only noble, mobile forces that we had. And as rapidly as we could get C-47s, our planes, we were all flown in to the three most strategic and weakened spots. And th therefore, it would take our position. But we only could go in with what we could carry. So at the 82nd was a bit north of us. The 101st was at Bastogne, as you know, and we were south of the 101st driving in, and we would be attached to Patton's 3rd Army. Well, you can see then that when we first met the enemy, we didn't have artillery support, even though I was an artillery forward observer, and we didn't have air support. The weather was horrible, damp, overcast. Patton, in fact, put the plea out, you know, that prayer. Wasn't that kind of a guy, really. But anyway, as a result, when we moved in there, we just had to stop Tiger tanks to the, with the best of our ability. Malleable hand grenades that were would stick to the track and explode, getting in on the side of the tank or in a rear ventilator, and bazookas. And we, the first three days that we faced the Germans without any air support and with no artillery support, might see the artillery came in 
after the infantry, parachute infantry, and after us uh, accompanying them as parachute forward observers. So it was at that point we lost a thousand kids in total casualties a day for three days out of our 10,000 men, just literally bringing that massive German armor to a halt. The thing that helped us so much at the end of three days was Patton's prayer and the skies cleared and the 761st all tank, black tank battalion came to support us. We thought when we heard these tanks to our rear, oh, the Germans have outflanked us from Bastogne. We were not too far from Bastogne. And when we saw the first Sherman tank, we said, oh, there are us, there are us. And as a result, when they pulled in, of course, the hatch was down because it's hostile territory. The lead tank man from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, opens the hatch, stands up, and we all looked at him in the deep snow. His black face was the most beautiful thing we had seen. And he said, you all need some help. I said, oh God, do we need some help? And they supported us until we ended the Belgian part of our tour of duty as we went south and then got into Luxembourg and then they would prepare for the uh, assault on the, across the Rhine River in March, but boy, did they do a, do a job for us. And it was a presidential uh, uh, unit badge that we also received given to them for the unbelievable work that they had accomplished. I, I interviewed a man, his name is Rivers McIntosh. He's a black man that was with the 761st. Yeah, it was, it, I, it was so noteworthy that Anna and I were able to meet this sergeant from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania before he passed away. And we have established such a warm relationship with the family. And in fact, that one 10 minute uh, thing dealt with that burial of him, that we were able to help put the family at ease and to tell them how much he meant to us in his unit. Well, your, your description of the Battle of the Bulge is, is good. Um, I, I, I'm enjoying hearing what you're saying. Um, the Germans pushing into the lines, making the bulge or what have you. Wasn't that originally called the Battle of the Ardennes? Yes. The Ardennes forest was a heavily forested area, and that was partly one of the factors that contributed to, to being so tough plus the worst winter in the history of Europe for, uh, for many years. And it, snow and cold, sub-zero sometimes, and in which our, the parachute infantry and us that were her, their forward observers because we always jumped with the parachute infantry and, and called back to our artillery to support us. But it was unbelievable just the horrible conditions, plus like uh, we mentioned, the fact that we didn't have any air support at first, and in fact we didn't get any tank support until the 761st came in. If you need to blow your nose, go ahead. I gotta adjust your microphone. Make sure your microphone's doing good here. You're doing good. Fantastic. Okay, you all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll keep rolling here. Well, I'm very, I'm, you, you know I'm very interested in the Battle of the Bulge because that's my next major World War II yes. documentary. So I've been very fortunate and blessed to have a lot of stories, which will end next week at the Battle of the Bulge reunion. Um, and then I'll have enough stories to start working on putting it together for history's sake. Um, okay, we'll go on here. So, and, I, and I'm enjoying listening to you, just thinking about you being back during World War II, and your, your memory is so good. 
Well, you know, what is fantastic is the fact that we stayed in the, on the line long after the 101st and 82nd were relieved, although understand they had, they, they had other previous uh, campaigns. But we were on the line for about 52 days, which meant, you know, we, in the 52 days that I was with the parachute infantry, the 513th parachute infantry, I was responsible to, for the second battalion as a non-com now. And as a result of that, I delivered fire. I would set up defensive lines at night so that if we, there was an attack in the morning, we would just simply say, fire on designated line. And we could send 96 rounds out there in just unbelievable time, not from our little pea shooters, the 75s, but on all the artillery I could call in by that time. It was unbelievable. It was uh, the thing that was most difficult for me to watch was, of course, we were shelled constantly, and the German 88 millimeters would come into the tops of the trees and just send the sh shattered fragments right on top of us. And we often didn't have a chance overnight to dig a foxhole and cover it. You know, you just was, had so much time and you were so fatigued that you crawled in a hole with a buddy for body warmth and tried to get as much rest as you could. But the things that really bothered me more than anything else was that 20, first 24 hours when psychologically I saw one of our best officers and one of our best radio operators just go completely out of it, had to be evacuated, never to return. And in fact, the, the officer had suicidal tendency and ended up in a ward where my sister, as a whack, that was dealing with those that had mental problems from the war. The other thing that bothered me the most was, boy, when the shell, shelling would come in, and we'd call medic. It was unbelievable. Those kids went out of the safety of their hole and rendered on to the guy that was wounded. And it was a second or third day when we were still getting hammered tremendously that when I woke in the morning and I had heard the cry, medic, medic, and then Another volley come in, and then it was quiet. And I came out of my foxhole, and there was, were two dead persons. But the person that was underneath was one of our paratroopers. And the medic had, had the white bandage still clutched in his lifeless hand. And I'll never forget that scene. And I, you know, you, when you're ordered to move, all you can see too is that he's tagged for the burial detail. You can't pick up his name or you don't have time and, and you really don't ever reconcile the psychological things that you have suppressed until you get into a place of safety. But those are the kinds of things I would have just wanted to come home and be able to tell a parent, do you know what your son did? He gave his life for another man, but there was no medal because it was no one to substantiate it and we would be long gone and the burial detail would be two or three days behind. And the kids would be frozen stiff and they would be loaded on trucks just like fodder and taken to the military cemeteries. I'm not trying to say we, we didn't do things right, but it was so difficult to realize that those kids that should have had some kind of special honor by the hundreds were overlooked. So as we would progress now with the 764 first supporting us and good artillery, then we began to take village by village by village 
One of the things that our general, General Miley, Major General Miley, never given a lot of the orals that Gavin and, and uh, the 101st Commander were, but he insisted that we take the high ground before night would fall. He didn't want us to receive all of the horrible uh, artillery fire. And so, men, before night falls, we take the high ground. And one of the most challenging experience, you see, as a forward observer, I have to keep track. I'm right with the infantry, but I've got to keep track of the enemy and lay down offensive before they make their charge or else set up that defensive line to stop them from ever coming through. But it was so difficult in this one area because the kids, when I call them the kids, D, E, and F company paratroopers ran out of ammunition and they were supposed to take the high ground. And they called back and said, we are out of ammo. And they had, the trucks could hardly get in because the roads were mined. And I said, I'll give you blanketing fire and stay ahead of you because you know, I could see all of this. I had to be able to see everything. That's why the uh, forward observers were, uh, the casualty rate was 80% roughly. So I did that, and as a result, the officer, a first lieutenant, I can never forget that, called to his men, fix bayonets. Last bayonet charge of the ETO, and I was able to at least take the artillery fire up, but then those kids had to take the last of that with the bayonet. And Sam, he was the lieutenant that I knew so well, he was the one that led them, and of course he was, he was wounded in the, in the attack. But that's the kind of fortitude and the kind of cohesiveness and esprit de corps that was part of Airborne. We didn't know everybody, but we would lay down our lives if necessary for each other. And it was just an, an, an intangible that was indescribable. I'm not saying that other units didn't. But the airborne fraternity, because of the kind of drastic and very difficult training, just closed ranks. And as a result, you know, it was something to see. Now you're a forward observer, is that correct? Part, yes. Forward observer, what's your rank at that time? I was a corporal. I, when I left Fort Benning, I was a training sergeant, and they said, you don't have to go yet. I said, well, there, somebody has to go from our rigor outfit and the other two fellows are married with children. Mm. They said, we're gonna bust you down to a T5. I said, well, that's the way it is. Because, you know, they would come around and say, tomorrow one of you will have to go. And I didn't want my buddy Barney to be one of them that would have to go when I was single, even though we were engaged. The battle of the bulge lasted about a month, a little over a month? It, if you, in some ways, it lasted from December the 16th to fe about February the 15th when the, when the thaws came. For us, it ended on February 15th. Because, you see, once we had reached and pushed the bulge out and had met the troops driving south, we all wondered what was going to happen. Well, we went, got on trucks and started out, and we sort of headed south. And we kept wondering, where are we going? We stopped at a place, I forget the name now, and they said, everybody out and shed everything from your stinking underwear 
to overcoat, just filth and nothing. No changes except our socks to keep us from getting frozen feet or trench foot. And we got our first, first shower and we saw our first Red Cross girls with hot coffee and donuts. And we thought to ourselves, well, maybe we're getting civilized, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of smelling each other. <laughs> Thank goodness it was cold because, you know, it was unbelievable, 30 days without any kind of change. But as a result, we got on our trucks and we knew when we saw the castles, we were in Luxembourg, the little duchy of Luxembourg. And there we had to crack the Siegfried line down at the Ore River. It's never been known that we were into Germany before any other unit. The 513th as a unit and me as a forward observer. But you see, then at that point, we were going into February. And when the thaws came, and they revealed places like Malmedy, where our prisoners of war, and there were so many that were captured, you know, when Germans made this massive, they were either bound or just mowed down. And when the snow melted, here were all the olive drab boys. So it, it was the last thing, in a sense, that we needed. And then we were sent back to Chalons, France, because we were selected to be the unit to jump with the British 6th Airborne Division to get our troops across the Rhine. Okay, let me ask you, I can't remember in our correspondence if, if you were involved with liberating any of the concentration camps. That's the interesting thing about the 761st. When we were, we parted our ways with the 761st going up and supporting another unit and we made the curve down into Luxembourg. We have that on our chart. Now, as a result then, everybody was stymied. We had all of our troops on the West Bank and Germany, of course, it was on the East Bank, and they vowed, as well as Hitler, that you'll never cross the Rhine, because they said not, no one accomplished that since Napoleon in 1805. So we knew we were going to have a major problem, because we wouldn't have any French or Dutch underground to help us. It's very important in an airborne operation. We knew we were going in there and we had to consider every one of the German civilians as someone that might kill. And so as a result, Ike and Churchill, I don't know how many people realize that, came up to the west bank of the Rhine. They could have been shelled with long range German shelling. And they watched our convoy going in, and it was 250 miles long, the caravan of C-46s and C-47s and gliders. You see, we had two glider units, too. And as a result, we jumped 10 miles east of the Rhine, and we were to drop and set up a big perimeter defense with the 6th Airborne, and that would protect the Rhine so that our kids would come across on invasion barges, just like they would have invaded D-Day. And we never lost a man coming across there because we were able to hold. It was interesting that the two airborne divisions faced about 80,000 German troops that were trying to get in so they could block the Rhine. It was the bloodiest single day in airborne history when we went in on Operation Varsity, March 24, 1945. But it was the most successful. And of course, as I said before, Ike and 
Churchill watched this caravan going over and its massive structure. And Gavin, who was the head of the 82nd Airborne and a great airborne commander, sec second to ours, our general, he was in a B-17 and he watched this whole thing unfold. Of course, he has al had always jumped with his men and it was the first time to watch the massive, unbelievable spectacle of thousands and thousands of parachutes and gliders coming in and then holding against the enemy. So, so you see, that was very important. And at that point, one of the units, now can you imagine, <laughs> fate or whatever you want to call it, coincidence, one of the first units across the Rhine to take advantage of the safety of our perimeter defense was a 761st, and they knifed right deep into Germany as fast as they could go and liberated the first uh, concentration camp. You know, there was a very poignant special done on that because it was so interesting, the fact that they realized that they were not going to come back to America as an equal citizen, and yet they were freeing these people and they had served so brilliantly. So it, it, they went that direction, and of course, after we held and get, had all of our troops across and they were moving toward the heartland of Germany, we hopped in the back of British uh, Churchill tanks and took off on one particular road, which finally led to my personal disaster at, at Munster, Germany, and our lives being saved, in a sense, by that German Frau. But it, it, it's something as we, we, we couldn't get over the fact that when we saw the tanks mark 761st and they were moving through and, and they waved as they knifed into Germany. Did you personally come in contact with the Tiger tanks? You mentioned the yes. sticky bombs. Did you throw some of those? What did you soak them in grease or something? Or what the, did you? We, or? we were lined up along what would have been their attack route. And they, it, they weren't fragmentation. We had to mold them out of this pl plastic uh, explosive. Now, it was okay. It was safe. Then put this fuse into it. And then we knew if you ever get in front of that tank, you're done. But we knew that if we could just get one of those grenades into the tank treads and blow it off, you know, it'd just go around the ring, or if we could get in the back where the ventilators were. Mm -hmm. And that's where a bazooka would come in. Because the Tiger tank at the front was just invincible. You know, you just really couldn't knock a Tiger tank out from the front. And Patton learned that a long time before a lot of other generals did. That you don't go face to face with a Tiger tank versus a 36 ton Sherman. You get around the back. And because my feelings on Patton are very strong, especially, you know, when he tried to override Ike, and then at the same time, he always was a nemesis for Patton. This is interesting. Um, so you're fighting, you're a Ford Observer, what kind of, you carry an M1, what do you have with yourself? I, I personally carried a carbine on the side with a folding stock because I had so much heavy equipment. Me and uh, what other, one other non-com, you know, the radio was a 610 radio and more powerful the in infantry radios were because we had to call back to our division and ask them to send the data back to the other big stuff, like where uh, Anna's brother was on a 240 millimeter. Boy, when they came in, you know, they, uh, it, it was a heart-rendering thing to call artillery in on infantry. 
But the Germans would tend to send their infantry before they started the tanks through. And we didn't do it that way to any degree. You know, Patton would maneuver his tanks to avoid frontal. But, um, but at any rate, when I would call fire for effect, and then when it would clear, oh my God, I couldn't believe that I could put that much death dealing out there. It, it was uh, psychologically, you know, you realize that you're saving your own men, but you just realize what you're doing, and in a case of the German soldier that was an ordinary Joe, they were just like us. It was when you ran into those pockets of SS troopers or you had an officer at the head, like at Malmody, that ordered them to just... And our Dutch friend said it was so different in the occupation of Holland if you had an SS officer versus if you had a German fellow that moved up through the ranks because they, they had a conscience. It was as, almost as if they had trained the SS trooper to be without conscience. So those were the kinds of things that, of course, linger in your mind. I might mention one thing when we got into Luxembourg and, and we were hammering away at the Siegfried line there. I had to do that with a single long tom uh, 155 in order to crack the uh, pillboxes. Yeah. But we got one night off to go back and have hot food. I, I mean, we're talking about 52 days and we've had nothing but K rations and black coffee, and the K rations, by the way, were, were fortified in some way because we got along on three of them, and uh, it was unbelievable. But anyway, we got a day back at Clairvaux, which was a parcel city in, in Luxembourg, and we were upstairs, and it was warm. And it was unbelievable as we were lying there, bedding down, and I had written to Anna on a stationery uh, that was a, a prison official somehow or another. I just, told, I just took whatever I couldn't get to get a letter off. And you know, when I fell asleep for that, what we were th hoping would have been, you know, a, a great night's sleep in the warmth and safety. two hours maybe into my sleep, I, wake, I wakened myself, sobbing convulsively. It was the first time I could, not that you don't feel that you could mourn. All those kids alongside of you that, and so it, it was so, so strange, you know, it just, I, I just hope, you know, the guys around me didn't hear it. But I, I did the same thing when I got back to Chalons, France, and we were preparing for the airborne invasion. I would wake up just sobbing and seeing the faces, you know, of the, of the kids that we had lost. But I, I just toss that in there because psychologically, you know, frontline combat, I mean, if we're back even a mile and a half for the first of the artillery, it's, it's, it, at least you have warm food and, you know, that kind of thing and some shelter. But when you're up there and have to just live in a foxhole that you dig and then dig some more to stay alive, it's just indescribable. Well, John, why do you think you made it back home? A lot of guys didn't make it back. So many things, so many things are hard to, to understand. Uh, you know, you, 
as some people have said, you have a sense of guilt sometimes about why did I get back and somebody else didn't, like Tommy and his brother Tommy. Of course, it's important to be vigilant. It's important to take care of and realize that you don't get off the beaten track in terms of booby traps and stuff like that. But you, you, you do also know that you have to go ahead and do things, you know, when you're going to take the high ground or whatever it is, you know it's going to protect the outfit from being shelled harshly. Just the different times, for instance, when we finally culminated in end, end of the bulge, we met the British Tommies. And we sat down and we broke open a case of condensed milk. Never enjoyed it so much in my life. In fact, I don't think I ever drank condensed milk. And we were drinking this condensed milk and all of a sudden a German shell came in and seriously wounded both the German Tommy and one of our guys. Well, my officer, I, I had only one bad officer. Well, I had encounters with two because the airborne officers always jumped with their men and by and large were excellent. My officer during the Battle of the Bulge uh, was not. I mean, he didn't put his men first and uh, I could go into great detail, but he uh, it wasn't our jeep, it was the engineers that had just cleared a roadway into us. And a truck was able to come in and have these, uh, you know, we got some rations for a change. But, you see, it, he ordered me to take the jeep and take these two wounded men back. Now, of course, we knew that they were desperately wounded. And it wasn't a question about that, but I said, Lieutenant, I said, wouldn't it be better if one of the fellows that came up and cleared the road would take the Jeep back? He said, Corporal, you're taking it back. Well, we, night was coming. The engineer came up to me and said, boy, Mac, please watch at one of the curves because there is a cluster of mines over to the right side and there's a German sign that says Minen, M-I-N-E-N. Well, as we were going, we were get, getting shelled and we were going just as fast as we possibly could. I never saw that sign and I said, something, something caused us to, to miss that as we made the curve in the road in the midst of shells coming in and all that. That was one because I, we did get the two kids back. He never reported that though. He never reported it as far as me and my buddy taking them back under fire and saving their lives. At Munster, we're Finally, the, the incident with the German Frau. My success in laying down fire to help the fellows in D, E, and F companies of the parachute infantry, I, I had responsibility for three companies. Wow. We got into, into Munster and we were just, we had found uh, eggs in what the Germans called sil uh, silica uh, water glass in a barber shop. And oh, we hadn't had uh, eggs and they, we were hal halting there and, I, and we were just getting ready for a, 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 an egg fry. And a call came out that E Company, one of my companies, was pinned down by an SS unit that had set up a perimeter defense with a, 11 uh, ground 88s and had captured Sherman tank. And they had, they were dedicated to fight to the last man. Uh, strength perhaps a hundred and some. 
they called us in the artillery and I and the, and the radio operator and the officer at first, my, a different officer, by the way, on our Operation Varsity, a good man, really a good man. Smokey was his nickname. But at any rate, he, uh, we went out and we had a quick reconnoiter with a major who was in charge of the battalion. And we sat there and mapped out very quickly, very, very quickly, that I and our, my crew would go up to the front on the left side and get within 150 yards of the SS position. Mm -hmm. And then they would quietly come in behind and line up well behind me and wait down uh, flat while I would ask artillery to come in and then adjust the fire and just blast that outfit into oblivion. Well, I had just sent the sensing back, it used the coordinates, and they were able to tell the distance. And I asked for one round of smoke, which was white phosphorus, so I could see where the land went, not to hurt men, but so you could see where the, land, uh, the, the first shell hit. And I had just made the adjustment, and to this day, I'll never forget, that same officer, the major, stood up and fired his M1 at a German soldier he saw, a German SS trooper, that he saw in their enclosure. Well, they just took every one of those guns and they shot these shells into these giant oak trees. I don't want to exaggerate this, the cries. And so late in the war, April, well, by this time it was April, the cries of the wounded and the dying. Just as I was ready to fire for effect, the first shell off to my right, because they could detect radios, mm -hmm. exploded, and it got me in the right forearm. The radio operator was already wounded. Captain Elmer was already wounded. I had to somehow or another, with these shell fragments in the right forearm, make an adjustment this was all, all these shells were coming in. I was able to get a second round and then a call for fire for effect, which meant that all available artillery would fire on that enclosure. Of course, by that time, half of the company, half of the company were casualties. I received shell fragments to the right upper arm, and then a shell fragment came through my helmet, shredded the, the visor, and I still have the scars in my nose here. Three separate wounds. But you see, by the time my fire for effect got, came in, it allowed the other kids that were survivors to be relieved because there was no officer immediately there was never reported at all about this man that later became a major general. People say, well, you, it was your duty to report it. I said, I spent two and a half months in the hospital. I said, would they have believed a non-com against the major West Pointer. But I said, that that's the type of thing that, I'll never forget that April 3rd, we lost so many kids. When I walked through the cemeteries Mount, uh, at uh, Margrotten in Holland, and Henri Chappelle in uh, Belgium, and uh, where Patton's buried down in Luxembourg. 
at Holm Cemetery. And there were these dates, those dates, April the 3rd. I was three and a half months getting rehabilitated, you know, and, and so on. But uh, it, it just gives you some kind of a perspective. Why would that artillery coming in to our position, all on the right side, hitting up there and just shredding death all over. And I, get, I, was, I was wounded seriously, but I wasn't, I wasn't killed. So, you know, is, and, and the same with uh, when we jumped, by the way. I, I do, do need to say this if, this if if I have time. For the first time in the history of the Airborne, in order for us to go in one time and not like at Market Groden, we jumped from C-46s and C-47s simultaneously. We in the infantry and the forward observers jumped from the C-46s and we had never been trained to go out a left door. I'll tell you that was traumatic because we had, when we were trained in the C-47s to go out the right door, it became second nature to you. You didn't have to think about that, you could think about survival. But when you went out the left door with the bigger props on the C-46, Holy smokes, it was, you, your opening shock would just pulverize the capillaries in your arm and in your groin area. Because if you didn't have good body position, and it would, when, when your chute finally opened, it would just whip you uh, unbelievably. But that, when my chute opened, we came in at 450 feet. And all the flack was indescribable. I grabbed the front two risers, which had seven suspension lines each, and I just hauled it down and held it down, which means you go down twice as fast as if your chute is totally open. And I got down through this screaming shrapnel up there. Left just before I hit, 50 feet up, I left the chute open up and hit. But it was those kinds of things, you see, that some of the kids didn't think about. Well, when I went out the door, I saw limp guys just hanging there. I saw one chute in which the kid must have hit his circular disc, and it was empty. The chute was empty. They just found a couple of our kids. You know, if, if the chute didn't open, it could go into a swampy area and just because of the you know, awful dimension. But as I said, it was the bloodiest day in airborne history, but it was the most successful because we followed so much the kinds of planning that we had always done. Wow. And that's why I have a hard time forgiving Monty for the kinds of things he did when he sent his beloved paratroopers in there to Arnhem and we walked around that cemetery just not believing that this could have occurred. A lot of casualties at the Battle of the Balls. I think the worst battle we've ever fought other than the Civil War. Oh, yeah. But what, what was the result of the casualties? You mentioned your airborne casualties, but the ground troops just I mean, was it just artillery, small arms, a combination of all? We lost a lot of people. A lot of them, to my way of looking at it, didn't have, did not have the benefit of officers that were so keenly aware of the kinds of things we should do. Now, understand, I told you I had this problem with the one. And not only that, but serving under Patton. That is a psychological experience that I will never, never forget. He would turn up at the darndest places in just a, a lacquered helmet liner and pearl-handled pistols just as if he was 
you know, braving. And, and uh, he did something to kids. You know, you didn't too often see many generals up at the front, yeah. except in an airborne operation. But it, it was so uh, unbelievable. And like I say, when, Gen when General Miley, our division commander, and, and General Patton came up, <laughs> you know, guys, anybody that saw them were believers, even though uh, Patton was controversial about his slapping that soldier in Sicily. But he, he was a good man. If he would have been supported in August when he had made this magic and powerful sweep through Europe, and the Germans say that. We met many of the German officers either through our association or through the three, three trips that Anna and I made. And they said, we, we couldn't believe that they held Patton up at uh, Montgomery's bidding. He wanted to straighten out the lines. You know, he is that kind of guy, set place. He had to have everything. He, he would have gone right through. And we could have dropped the five airborne divisions, two British and three American, right at the Rhine and the war would have been over by August or September. Hold, hold on a second, I'm gonna change the tape. I normally would stop right now, but I'm gonna go just a little longer, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I wanna ask you a couple follow-up questions. So I'm gonna, I asked you why you came back, and obviously you're, you believe in God, you're a Christian. Um, during the war, what got you through the tough times? Was it your training and your faith, or a combination of both, or, or what got you through those tough times? It would have been both uh, reared, raised and reared in a uh, Christian home with two other uh, brothers in the service and a sister. And of course, having met Anna in high school, uh, that, those were some of the bolstering things because just writing and whenever you could and just the feeling that somebody was cared and was writing and was praying for you. Uh, I carried a testament. I had a little long here, but uh, I had two in, in, in two, the two different operations. But one of the things that was most notable to me was in January the 3rd, when perhaps we had one of the most vicious attacks by the Germans. And I had to call this massive artillery in, and we had dead German bodies out in front in the snow. And in the foxhole, I just kind of mentally noted that the Belgian time and a differential in hours, six hours, that mother was at home and Anna was at home and they were praying. And when I got home, in the one testament that I had given her from Fort Sill, Oklahoma, she entered in the flyleaf that on this certain date of January the 3rd, which would have coincided with my worst time during that night, she had lifted up these special prayers because somehow or another she was wakened by something. And I just got, it was the most miraculous kind of feeling that you got. And all of the uh, different times, and, and you know, for us, for instance, 24 of us were lying in those bar, uh, the uh, house, German house, and everybody in their haste to, to take care of the enemy and everything else, no guards were left there. We were, had no weapons. We were heavily uh, under the influence of morphine, thank heavens, but at the same time it made you very vulnerable. And all of a sudden, 
this German Frau appearing. Those are the kinds of things that you just, and for us to accept her cup of coffee, see, was really contrary to everything that we were told. Don't, not that you would, they wanted you to do anything wrong against the enemy, but don't take anything for granted, men, women, or children. And she just went around and gave us this, uh, uh, whatever it was, some kind of a concoction of, made of cereal more than coffee, and adjusted our bandages. And when I asked that the ambulance drivers, they got into us five hours later. I said, did you see this German Frau? And they said, we didn't see any German Frau. And, and of course, they were thinking that we were all so full of morphine, it wasn't even funny. But my friend Tommy from Ohio, he said, yes, Mac, there was a German Frau. But it just goes to show we never did find her in three trips. Just kind of summarize the importance of the Battle of the Bulge to the ending of the war. Just give me a quick summary of how important that was and then the end result of the Battle of the Bulge. I would say the stopping of the German thrust, which would have driven right to the North Sea and cut off everything from the North, uh, uh, the 1st Canadian Army, the 2nd British Army, the American 9th Army, and the American 1st Army. We'd have had everything split, and it then would have come the cry at home because of the casualties. Give them an armistice just to end this whole thing. We could have lost the war, in a sense, as far as being able to occupy and properly deal with the German occupation. That's one thing I, I have to say, that when you think about what we did in both fanatical countries, we went in there, we had no problems like, such as they encountered in Iraq, and in both Japan and Germany, we made them into world powers, uh, economic powers, by get, getting them to help themselves. But you can see that if we, if this Battle of the Bulge could have, uh, it would have been drastic. And so that's why the slaughter, it really was a slaughter in a Battle of the Bulge, was necessary it was critical to, to finalizing the war in Europe in May of 1945, and critical to the final satisfaction of the war in, in, in August of 45 in Japan. Do you think Hitler really felt he could win that battle? I think Hitler at that stage of the ball game when reading money of the, the books about Rommel, uh, I don't want to use the wrong term, but I think he was, in a sense, just a raving maniac at that point, listening not to his troops, but to his own intuition and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, because there was one thing for sure, uh, those that fought against Rommel realized that he was a, was a genius in the art of warfare and the, the high respect that they, they had for him, even though he was, you know, the enemy. But it was so important, I think, and people don't realize how important it was that these kids st stood there and stopped the Germans, sometimes with literally <laughs> just rifle and bazookas and hand-fashioned grenades at great cost, but it was very, very critical to the final victory, which enabled us to have all this half century or more of peace, when you think about it, with major powers. Sure, we've had brush fires, and, but uh, it, that, I think that was very important. 
I'm going to adjust your microphone one more time. I've already got two, I think, a couple more questions, and we'll be done, okay? Sure. Okay. Okay. All right. I, you know, being a veteran of World War II, John, and an American citizen, what, is, what does freedom mean to you? And tell me about the price of freedom. The price of freedom is just... Uh, can only be described, I guess, by taking a couple of the expressions of uh, the, the writer from World War II. Freedom isn't free. Freedom has cost so much in our own history that people must realize that the sacrifices that had to be made in order for this to occur. Now, when people get concerned about some of the brush fire uh, affairs and how it's handled, that's a little bit different. But these were life and death things where we faced three huge Italian, German, and Japanese war machines destined to fight to the death almost. And this, that was would have turned our civilization into an unbelievable scourge. And uh, I think everyone that ever does any reading about the Battle of the Bulge and the awesome cost should in, be in reverence to it. Uh, again, like I say, that's the theme of so many of our guys when we meet is not the glory of the whole thing, but the fact that we contributed the best we could toward this prize of freedom. And it's maybe intangible for some, but for us it's real. For the veterans and for the families, the cost is awesome. Tell me what the American flag means and represents to you as a veteran. Well, to me, it's, it's, it's almost a, a banner of glory, and we, we haven't always been throughout history been right. Sometimes we've made mistakes, but you see, it, it's the banner of freedom. And when you think about the fact of us establishing this after the likes of the British Empire, and then being able to cope with the incidents that occurred and threatened us. It is something that the emblem of that flag flying is just unbelievable. That's when we, as a result of going into the military cemeteries, the military cemeteries are, are almost manicured. They are so beautiful and so well taken care of. And I'll never forget when we went to Margraten, not only to see a lot of my buzzy buddies that are buried there, but Tommy is buried there, and they chose to allow him to remain there. But when you come up the steps, you don't have an inkling. You come up the steps and then bursting upon you, just as far as you can see, are all these white crosses and the signs of David. And then you walk in and you individually see this one and this one, and then sets of brothers that, that you know, and you re just realize, because like I say, when we come back, and I went back to, Bloomsburg to get my degree, and we're 27 kids, and their faces never change. The one thing about those that died in the war, they have remained perpetually young. But it's just a symbol of the kinds of thing that we have been willing to do, and the kids that just volunteered, so many of them, you know, to, to do this. Anna's class, I can remember, the kids, some of them didn't wait for graduation. They were so anxious to get in there. 
so that that banner, that star-spangled banner, is not an abstract thing that we just fly without thinking. It's a symbol of all the bravery that has occurred in supporting and leading our country and making it what it is. Very good. Um, I think I'm done for now. Um, there's a lot of questions I can continue to ask you, but let me ask you this. Why, why did you feel so strongly about talking to me? Why, why do you want to tell me your story? Well, I had done something for uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the one network. Uh, 700 Club. Yeah. yeah, and then also the one. Uh, it was a history channel. Wasn't yeah. But see, they weren't really getting into it in, in the depth that I felt. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm well, no the expert. The club was the one on forgiveness. Because you had a hard yeah. time forgiving. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, yeah. that, that was true. That was kind of and, and, yeah. But you see, uh, I just, I long for, before I pass away, to just see more people aware and more people realizing that the awesomeness of 1941 and, and taking on those three major totalitarian states and just pursuing that thing and just because as uh, also the author says the military cemeteries are the most precious and costly real estate in the world. That, I really feel that way. When you just, when those crosses, and they're all in perfect symmetry, wherever you look, in perfect symmetry, you just, oh, it, it oh, everyone somehow or another should become more aware of the, of the sacrifice. Yeah. What, what would you tell a young person today about that? Well, see, that's the, that's the one thing I have some concern about. Uh, our son, John, our oldest, came along very six, quickly in 46, uh, was a, a teacher for 36 years and, and a coach. But his history classes reflected his deep concern that kids are supposed to know what has been done for them. And, and uh, everywhere that we w walk in Millerstown, because they both put in 36 years of teaching, our son Tom is a chemistry teacher, but he wanted, and that, to me, I'm so disappointed about the fact that history teachers will allow history to be dull. Whenever a kid says, oh, it's so boring, you know, it just cuts me to the core because it said, what kind of history are you learning? Not that you glorify war or, or anything of that sort, but you have to know that what you have today here in America is a result of kids that were willing to lay down their lives and that, that we're not doing. We're really not doing that. What do you want to be remembered for someday when you're gone? Well, I would just hope, and that's the only thing that drives me, and uh, sometimes uh, I, I think heavens that Anna's, Anna's willing to uh, go along with me. Uh, I, I just want my children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to know that Papa cared. They all call me Papa because it, it, is, so, it is so crucial. See, my mother was German by background, and her father, my grandfather, 
would tell me as a 10-year-old, he died in 1935, he said, I watched, he was a very stern kind of, he scared me at first, you know, until I got to know him, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of a gruff German. But he would say, I can still remember my brother. I was 10 years of age and he was going off to the Civil War in 61, 1861. And he said, he went up to that highest hill over there, John. And then he turned around because he was walking to a train station over in Nescopec. And he waved. And he went through every campaign of the, of the uh, Army of the Potomac. And he died of swamp fever that spring. And he, this gruff German would get, his eyes would moisten. And you see, it's those kinds of things that you know, you're, you're brought aware of the importance of you know, something greater than yourself. And that's the same way I taught history. What's that? And the kids always, <laughs> the kids that come back are now are getting old, very old, but they tell me, you know, that you made history live because you talked about people. You didn't talk about dates. You, they became just incidental. But that's, that's the important thing. I, I just would hope that I've made some contribution, not only in terms of my vocation, and not only in terms of uh, being a good husband and a good father, but I would hope that somehow or another I left something, you know, that's worthwhile in the hearts and minds of the people I've been able to do uh, come in contact with. And it's interesting, soon after we made this final thrust here, I got a call from Penn State, and they're having two speakers from World War II, <laughs> and they want me to come up to Old Maine, up at uh, Joe Paterno's place. <laughs> Uh, to talk uh, uh, right in front of Old Main on the lawn. They'll be out in the lawn. But it's that kind of thing that, you know, I'm happy to do. I'm not, yeah. I, I said to, you know, I, I don't want to ever become an ego thing. No. I just want it to be something in which you, and, and the kids, <laughs> oh, the kids and their faces, you know what I mean, that I served with. Oh. As I said, I said that many times, that I had three times that they asked me to give the address at the memorial service. But I said, the one th thing, fellas, we came back and became old and wrinkled. But those kids have been perpetually young. It's like a passing parade. At the end of my interviews, John, I always have the veteran give me a salute into the camera. When I ask you, can you do that for me? Oh, of course. Okay. Just a second here. This is my signature. This is, this, at the end of my films, you'll see this. So whenever you're ready, look right into the camera and give me a salute. Stay seated, though. Yes, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. I'm going to take a picture.